Okay, thank you. So, hello everyone. Um, very happy to be uh, presenting to you today. Um, I hope you're having good weather over there. The weather over here is not so great. Uh, but I'm uh, delivering this from San Jose, California. Um, I always appreciate a chance to uh, talk to uh, people at Jamboree. Uh, my talk today is going to be the status of embedded Linux. Um, this is the March 2018 edition, and uh, I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. So uh, I, I think a lot of you, uh, if you've come to Jamborees before, you've probably seen this talk before, but just to give a background for those uh, who may be new, uh, the nature of this talk is that it's just a very quick overview of lots of different embedded topics. Uh, I don't go into any particular topic in great detail, uh, but the idea is that you can use uh, these slides. Uh, the slides are already posted on the, on the wiki page for uh, the event. Uh, but you can use the slides. There are lots of links to articles um, and references to talks that you can go watch those talks. Uh, so if you see something that's interesting to you, uh, you have uh, something that you can go look for and, uh, and research. So just hopefully give you some idea of uh, some of the interesting things going on with embedded Linux. Uh, so here's the major outline uh, that we'll be going through the talk. And I'll start with kernel versions. So over the past year, uh, we've had five kernel versions. That's very, very standard these days. The, uh, uh, you can see uh, the, in, within the past year, uh, we've had from 4.11, and we're now working on 4.16. Uh, and the pace is very consistent. It's either 70 or 63 days. Uh, Linus Torvalds always releases a, the kernel on a Sunday. Um, he's, that's a very uh, consistent habit that he has. And uh, you'll notice that uh, and, and it's very consistent in terms of the tempo, either 70 or 63 days. So it's either nine weeks or 10 weeks. And uh, there's a two week um, merge window that happens and then usually followed by seven or eight uh, uh, release candidates. So I had originally predicted that uh, 4.15 would be 70 days, and uh, this one was actually longer. We had uh, one more week, uh, and the difference, of course, was uh, I'm sure you've heard of the issues with Spectre and Meltdown, some really big security issues that uh, that uh, some mitigations and some code was, was uh, in this release. One thing that I think is actually really amazing is that even though uh, Meltdown was a very, very serious bug. Uh, and it, it only delayed the release by one week. Uh, and that is, that is really amazing. Um, it's incredible. Uh, the, the processes that the Linux kernel has are just really, really good. So people started working on some of the Spectre mitigations uh, as early as uh, June or July and they flowed through the pipeline, and, and when they actually, they actually came time to get those integrated, uh, it didn't take much longer to get those integrated than a normal release cycle, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, we're actually on uh, 4.16 release candidate 3 right now, so the merge window was about three weeks ago. Uh, so I would expect 4.16 on March 25th, but just just because I think it would be funny, I, I'd prefer it if uh, Linus released the kernel on April 1st, because that would be April Fool's Day, so that would be kind of funny. Um, but that's just my personal preference. Uh, so if you look at uh, what's been in these kernels uh, the last uh, over the last year, I'm going to go over this fairly quickly, uh, because so, a lot of this material I've covered in, in previous jamborees and previous uh, instances of this talk. Uh, but in 4.11, there was a new kernel ref counting API, uh, a new tiny DRM subsystem added. That uh, tiny DRM, it's a, it's a. I think I explain this later when I go kind of uh, by technology area. Uh, but anyway, uh, another thing is the new static system call. That's pretty interesting. Uh, it provides for uh, 2038 safe time values. So uh, it basically there. The old system call is just the stat system call, but now it's uh, uh, 
it's been kind of updated to be more modern. Uh, it's got safe time values. I think they're all 64-bit or longer. And then it has masks of fields that you can obtain. Uh, so for efficiency, there's a lot of the old stack call, when you made the call, you, had, you got all of the values uh, that it provided. And some of the values actually take a while for the kernel to compute, and they're not actually needed every time you... So you can actually indicate with a mask of fields which of the values that you want to obtain for the system call. So that uh, makes it a lot more efficient. Uh, Sched.h has been uh, undergone some refactoring, or went, underwent some refactoring in this one. So that's uh, actually uh, where some of the major task uh, structures, including the task structure, for processes inside the kernel is. So any out of tree code uh, that use those structures really need to be careful and, and take into account uh, the changes here. Uh, pretty big internal kernel API. Nothing, nothing that affected the syscall layer uh, for programs, user space programs, but, in, but if you had kernel loadable modules uh, that you had out of tree, you needed to do some refactoring to match that. Um, then uh, in Linux 4.12, uh, we had a couple of new block I.O. schedulers. There's a lot, lot of work going on with block I.O. schedulers. We're still um, working to make sure that uh, we have good performance, especially on um, flash media, uh, on uh, essentially memory-based media. Uh, there's a lot of issues with the I.O. schedulers. Um, and that's being worked on and has been worked on a lot. Uh, and there was some mini TTY prep work. Um, so uh, one of the things I'll talk about in, in the in the si area of size reduction is the TTY code is actually fairly big, and a lot of embedded systems don't need the full TTY implementation. So a developer has worked on a, a smaller implementation of TTY. Uh, that did not get mainlined in, in this version, but some of the work to support that uh, feature was put into 4.12. Uh, there was proper support for USB Type-C connectors, and there's a new tool called Analyze Boot uh, the use, that is really useful for uh, getting a graph of boot events. Uh, this is coming out of uh, Intel has a, uh, it's actually their power management graphing tools project, PM Graph. Uh, but you can go look at that if you want to um, analyze uh, what's going on with the uh, the boot up time on your system, uh, or just you want to see the, the graph of boot events, not just looking at time, but just the sequence of events or other things you may want to look at. Um, for 4.13, uh, we had a new, well, there's a TLS implementation in the kernel. I don't remember what TLS stands for, but it's the uh, um, secure sockets uh, uh, layer. Uh, that is used when you're doing web over HTTPS as opposed to HTTP. So putting the implementation inside the kernel is uh, really helpful with performance. Uh, instead of having user space do that, uh, the TLS implementation inside the kernel actually does some, uh, uses uh, some of the crypto code that's internal. And, and because it's uh, you don't have some of the user's kernel space transitions, it's a little bit faster. Uh, so there's also next interrupt production prediction. Uh, so in order to try to make uh, interrupt handling faster, uh, the kernel actually tries to predict what the next interrupt that's going to be that's going to occur is and when it will occur, and, and tries to get prepared for it. Uh, also, the F2FS uh, uh, that's a flash file flash based file system has support for disk quotas and KSL test started transitioning to a new output format, the TAP13 protocol. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and then in Linux 4.14, getting here towards the end of uh, last year, uh, we had a new kernel stack unwinder. It's called ORC. Uh, the last one was called Dwarf. So uh, if you kind of know kernel developers, they like to do play on words. So dwarfs and orcs are uh, fantasy characters that fight each other. Uh, anyway, this uh, uh, the ORC stack unwinder has better unwinding. Uh, it's much faster. It's between 20 and 40 times faster than the old dwarf unwinder. Uh, and the a kernel unwinder is used when you get an oops uh, in the kernel to 
uh, do a stack trace back. And uh, so this one has higher memory overhead. It's about a megabyte of extra memory, uh, but it runs much faster and it's much simpler code. Uh, so uh, right now this is only available on x8664, uh, but uh, it's hoped that this will be able to be put onto other platforms as well uh, because it is a, a big improvement. Um, and then there's uh, there's new compression available. Uh, there's I have never heard of this routine, but there's something called Z, ZSTD or Z standard uh, compression, uh, and that's available now for ButterFS and SquashFS file systems. Uh, new compression system, and then there's uh, better CPU free coordination, uh, which is managing the CPU frequency uh, with uh, SMP systems. Um, let's see, 4.15, which is the release we just barely, this is the, the current released version of the kernel. It came out about the end of January. Um, a couple of interesting things here. Uh, we had CRAMFS support for mapping persistent memory. So CRAMFS is a particular file system. It's a memory-based file system in the kernel. Uh, but you can now uh, point it at um, persistent memory so um, not like DRAM or something like that, but something that's going to hang around. This is very useful for doing things like XIP. Uh, so uh, you can have your, your programs, you, basically you can have a file system that is persistent across kernel boots, and it, uh, when you do XIP, which is execute in place, uh, you can boot up the kernel a lot faster. The the, basically you don't have to load the programs into um, kernel memory, uh, you can just execute them in place inside the CRAMFS uh, file system. And of course they have to be laid out linear and there's a lot of restrictions, but uh, that's, that's actually really handy uh, for boot time reduction in certain circumstances. Uh, the AMD display core, so AMD made a big splash by putting a big chunk of their display core uh, for their GPU, their uh, graphics processing unit, into the Linux kernel, that was accepted. Uh, so that's actually it's something that's nice uh, to see. Uh, it's good open source GPU support. Uh, the device tree compiler actually added, finally, support for overlays. This is something that had been a long time. A lot of people have discussed this. So the compiler supports overlays, uh, and we need to see some of the firmware uh, and bootloaders actually start to use this. Uh, there's RISC-V support. So RISC-V is, is an open hardware processor. You can actually get uh, the definitions for this to, to essentially create your own processor based on, on uh, this RISC-V architecture. But support for that is in the kernel. Uh, and then, of course, the big news this release, really big news, was uh, Spectre and Meltdown security bugs. And I'm, I've got a whole section uh, in this talk where I'm going to talk about Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, but there were some uh, mitigations uh, that made it into the 4.15 release, uh, particularly KPTI and RETPOLINES, and I'll, I'll talk about both of those later. Uh, and then moving on to uh, kind of speculative, but uh, we've already had the merge window, so we know some stuff about 4.16. 4.16 should be released uh, either the end of March or the beginning of April. Uh, but uh, since we've had the merge window, we know that some patches have already been accepted. So there's initial support for the jailhouse hypervisor. Uh, so there's a hypervisor that um, uh, Siemens has been working on for quite some time, uh, and including with some real-time uh, functionality in it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's very nice. Uh, there's eBPF support for functions. Uh, it used to be that to write, so eBPF is a, stands for ex Extended Berkeley Packet Filter, uh, but what it is is it's if you are writing a program outside the kernel to be uh, to be impl to be executed inside the kernel, uh, primarily for things like trace points and for uh, routing table. So when people do net filter functions, they there's you load a set of programs that does the analysis on the packets as they go through the system. So it's essentially it's a virtual machine that's inside the kernel, but it uh, surprisingly it never had support for function definitions. And so now it does. Uh, so this is a virtual machine that's in the kernel, uh, and it's a lot more flexible now that you can define some functions 
uh, for programs that you write outside the kernel to be executed uh, kind of dynamically inside the kernel context. Uh, also in 4.16, so in 4.15 we saw mitigations for Spectre and Meltdown, but uh, those were for x86-64. Uh, some of some of the Spectre and Meltdown bugs, not all of them, but some of those apply to ARM64, and so uh, those mitigations are now being put in for that uh, architecture. Uh, and then uh, a couple other things, high resolution uh, timers, I suppose to say timers, have now have two modes uh, to allow them to be run in interrupt context, software interrupt context. So if you're if you're uh, deep deep in the kernel looking at uh, hardware timers, high res timers, uh, there's some there's some new things you should be aware of. Uh, this has mostly to do with uh, real time operations. And then besides the uh, the, besides the ARM64 mitigations for Spectre and Meltdown, there's some other Spectre mitigations that have come along. Uh, and this will make more sense when I talk about uh, Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, there's different classes of bugs, and so there's a lot of different code in the kernel to, to deal with these issues. Um, so that's, that's the kernel version. So let me move now on to the different technology areas. And I'm just going to go... Uh, kind of uh, topic area by topic area. I don't know if you've noticed, but I do this alphabetically. So we start with B for boot up time, and, uh, and we'll go down. I think it's T for tracing is the last one. Uh, but in uh, the area of boot up time, so if you're interested in boot up time reduction, uh, there's the new analyzed boot tool that I talked about that Intel uh, got into a 412 kernel. Uh, there's some really good uh, talks on this. There's not a lot of technology in the kernel for doing this, but there are some techniques uh, that have been described over the years in a lot of different talks uh, by Chris Simmons, Andrew Murray, John Mahaffey, and some of these are quite old. You know, Andrew Murray's uh, talk is uh, by now almost four years old, but it's still a great talk to go look at if you're doing boot time reduction. And then also if you're reducing boot time for Android, uh, there was a good talk by Bernard Rosenkranzer. Uh, talking about improving the boot up speed of AOSP. So in boot up time, there's not a lot of technology. I mean, there's some tracing things to help. Uh, not a lot of things you can do with config options. It really comes down to there's a the set of techniques you have to apply. And uh, some of these talks are really helpful for finding out those techniques. Uh, for device tree, which is um, an area of the kernel having to do with uh, uh, configuring the hardware or configuring the kernel to deal with to describe the hardware. Uh, there's been some work on this. Uh, most recent stuff is on device tree validation. So device tree, there's a language that's used uh, called the schema uh, and uh, <clears throat> that language, uh, well the schema, so there's the language of device tree, there's the configuration language uh, but then there's the schema has been just written in English before, uh, just as plain free-flowing text. And what they want to do is put that schema language into a formal language so they can do things like have a validator for the bindings and for device tree data. So uh, you can check that when someone writes, um, writes the description of their hardware, uh, the schema would help would have like type definitions and other things that would help them validate that, and make sure that they haven't made a mistake. So that there's a new proposal for this uh, by Pantelis and Grant Likely, and uh, we're likely to see some more work on this. Also, there's some desire to write an updated device tree specification. Uh, the old specification is quite quite old and kind of hard to obtain. Uh, and the Linux kernel has all kinds of extra details that are not in that original specification that would be good to document. And then uh, finally, as I said, one of the recent kernel versions, we finally added support for overlay. So the overlay feature is the ability, so what normally happens is uh, a board, the firmware on a board will pass a description of the hardware to the kernel, um, but and that's usually baked into the firmware, or the firmware does some discovery. Uh, but there's a lot of boards that have like daughter boards or capes or uh, shields, or they're, they're called different things for different boards, but they're essentially they're daughter boards that can fit on top of a, a board like a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone. And uh, 
in order to deal with those, you need to be able to modify that uh, device tree data that's coming from the firmware, and that's called an overlay. And so now the compiler fully supports overlays. Uh, so at uh, so you can compile an overlay and provide that uh, as a separate step to the kernel to describe some daughter board that's that's on your system. That's not something that could be baked into the firmware as it was originally written. Um, so that's a step forward for supporting those types of systems that have uh, that can be dynamically configured in the field. Um, in terms of file systems, just a couple of quick things about different file systems. I talked about the Z, Z standard compression for ButterFS and SquashFS. So this is faster and smaller, uh, both for compression and decompression. So it's a it's just a plain win all the way around. Uh, not often, a lot of times you have to make a trade off between size and speed, uh, but this one is both faster and smaller, so that's pretty good. Uh, there's some directions on how to use it if you go to this uh, ButterFS wiki. Um, and, uh, and then if you want to see some of the details about uh, the performance of this and, and how it compares, you can go look at this Foronix article. Um, uh, Foronix right there. I don't know if you can see my laser pointer. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, then uh, Flash, the Flash 2 file system added support for disk quotas in a couple of different releases to get this in, 4.13 and 4.15. Apparently, disk quotas are now being used by Android uh, to manage uh, part of the memory uh, or how apps use the system. And then UBIFS support uh, is an older file system, but that now has support for encryption. Uh, in terms of graphics, uh, I talked already a little bit about TinyDRM, uh, but I'll describe it a little bit more here. So uh, embedded systems uh, sometimes have uh, these small, simple displays um, that are just available over I2C or SPI instead of having like a full bus, uh, memory-based memory, memory -based bus to the system. They just got something simple. So this is things like that have little LCD displays uh, and you know, like just with like four or five lines of, or, you know, very low resolution. Um, and a lot of, a lot of those systems were using frame buffer drivers, uh, which is kind of the old uh, system. And they want to replace that DR direct rendering manager, which is what DRM stands for. That's the new method of uh, inter interacting with the graphics layer uh, in the kernel. And so we'd like to even support those simple small displays with DRM system, but we don't want to have the huge overhead, so they've made a tiny DRM system. You don't want to pull in a, a whole bunch of code uh, for these smaller displays. Uh, so you can look at uh, some of the information on that, again, at a Veronic <coughs> article. Um, uh, Vulkan has, is one area of graphics that's been progressing, and uh, it's made some good inroads. There was a presentation at ELC talking about uh, Vulkan. Uh, Vulkan is kind of the successor to, um, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it, direct, not direct FD, but uh, Open, OpenGL. Um, so uh, it's got some fast, it's some faster ways to deal with graphics um, uh, that's been worked on by several companies. And it's, I believe it's already supported, um, well, anyway, I'm not sure where, anyway, Another thing that I thought found interesting, I was looking at some of the uh, Linux Comp Australia talks, and uh, Keith Packard, who's been doing uh, Linux graphics for a long time, talked about uh, some new work that's happening on virtual virality. So uh, apparently, there's a lot of uh, kind of challenging issues to support virtual reality. It's uh, there's some differences in the display pipeline and and how the kernel has to manage things, um, and so. Uh, that work is ongoing, and it's being funded by Valve, uh, so there's kind of an obvious thing. Valve is a, uh, a game company, so and, uh, they're not they're not Oculus, but they do one of the other um, front, uh, virtual reality headsets, and so I think we'll see a lot of Linux-based virtual reality uh, support uh, coming in the future, so that's kind of interesting. In terms of GPU drivers, not a whole lot of change. Uh, this slide is actually fairly old. Um, Freedrino is continuing to be developed. 
Uh, there is nothing new on uh, on imagination support for an imagination. Uh, the arm molly. There was a little bit of work being done recently, but uh, not very much. Uh, so I don't think a whole lot of it has changed here. The biggest news was that AMD core that got supported. In terms of networking, one thing, one topic that's kind of come up recently that is kind of interesting is uh, time sensitive networking. So I didn't realize this until um, until. DLC Europe, but there's a whole um, there's a whole kind of um, set of standards uh, by the IEEE and a whole industry based around doing extending real time out into the network systems, uh, and so that's actually a fairly hard problem to have deterministic networking. Uh, but if you want a system composed of multiple nodes that are operating in real time, uh, then you do have to do uh, real time networking. And so you have to make some guarantees. So one of the things that's gone, gotten into Linux, uh, there's a, a SOTX time, that's a socket option transmit time. There's a new option that you can specify a high resolution time for when you want a transmit to occur. Uh, so you're seeing some real time features down in the networking stack. Uh, so very interesting work, and we'll probably see more about that uh, in the future. Uh, and then Bluetooth, this is going from brand new, cutting edge stuff, just to kind of older stuff. Bluetooth 5 has been supported for quite a while, uh, not, well, at least a year and a half, and uh, seems to be doing pretty well. And uh, some of the other, uh, uh, other networking protocols uh, are all very mature and well supported. Uh, so Linux is not lagging behind uh, any other operating systems in terms of uh, their networking support. Uh, in terms of power management, a um, couple of things that are interesting. We have power efficient work queues. Uh, so uh, work queues inside the kernel uh, are, you know, a mechanism for for scheduling work, uh, and they in the past. You just scheduled them, and they ran on whatever processor they happened to be available. Uh, but now they actually uh, the, there's algorithms inside the kernel to to um, actually look at what processors are active and which ones um, it would be expensive to pull out of idle. So it has to do with just managing uh, those the work queue job scheduling uh, more efficiently. And the results from uh, this new feature are about 50% better energy consumption, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so uh, there's just a lot more kind of this let's level very detailed work in the kernel going on to make things more power management efficient. The other thing is better CPU frequency coordination uh, with SMP. And I referred to this back in the, in the kernel section. But what this does is it allows uh, so CPUs on the system are running different bits of the code, right, and on an SMP system. And uh, it's often the case that a CPU will schedule some work on another CPU. Um, so, you know, something will be running in one place and it'll tell another CPU to start doing some job or some task. Um, but it, at the same time, uh, it used to be that the system would just kind of try to figure out uh, what the frequency needed to be automatically. So, so now with this new system, uh, a a CPU can schedule work on a different CPU, and and indicate whether a frequency boost is needed. So um, it's actually kind of amazing. The the processors in a modern system are all going up and down in speed uh, continually to try to conserve power. Uh, in this case, it allows a uh, uh, when work is scheduled, uh, you can actually uh, manage the frequency that you want the work to be done on and on a different CPU. So there's there's some interesting kind of details on that. Um, if you are interested in the power management stuff, that's just some of the newer work that's going on in the kernel. Um, the real time uh, big news. Well, uh, the real time summit was held in October. Uh, and there's a whole bunch, if you, if you are interested in real time at all, I recommend going out to this uh, LWN.net site and, and looking at the report of that summit. Uh, but there's a lot of different uh, 
talks, this, these four bullet, first four bullets, uh, real-time trouble lessons learned using personnel to detect and fix nested execution context violations. Uh, so I'm assuming that a real-time person wants to do that. <laughs> um, and then sketch deadline, what's next? Uh, and then the future of tracing with real-time. So these are all things that are that the real-time people in the kernel are looking at uh, very, very closely and present. Uh, there's information on using sketch deadline and and uh, doing this. Uh, the of course the the main real-time system in the Linux kernel is the preempt RT patch, and that is still out of tree, or there are portions of it still out of tree. About 90% of it has been mainline, uh, but there's a couple of pieces still outstanding. Uh, there's a hot plug locking code. Uh, there was some recent work on the, the Linux timer wheel uh, to make it more real-time friendly. The biggest outstanding issue with the preempt RT patch uh, that has not been mainlined yet uh, has to do with uh, the uh, directory entry cache and locking that. So any anytime you lock a structure in the kernel, uh, you have the potential to uh, start to cause uh, real-time problems for the rest of the kernel because any any held structure, any, any structure that has a lock held over it, um, can can cause latencies for other parts of the system. And so they're working on uh, some of that stuff. Uh, there's actually, um, I think for the first time ever, I heard Thomas Gleichner, who's who's kind of the maintainer of this preempt RT patch, uh, give out uh, an estimate for a date when he thought they'd actually be finished getting this all upstream. I don't think they'll actually ever be finished fixing stuff, but uh, they may actually get the last of the patch upstream I think he was. <clears throat> I think what I heard him say is that he expected it to happen sometime next year, 20, 2019. So that's uh, it's been. This patch has been out of tree for. Um, well, let's see. Since it was created in about 12 years ago, so uh, to actually see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, to use a train metaphor, that's uh, that's pretty neat. Um, and if you're interested in real time, there's lots of uh, presentations online, uh, at, especially at Embedded Linux Conference. Uh, some of these are from last year in Portland, uh, effectively measure and reduce kernel latencies, uh, real time Linux on embedded multi core. And then in, in Europe, we had some other ones. And we had this one on deterministic networking, and then uh, someone doing measuring the impacts of the preempt RT patch. And we will have some more talks at Embedded Linux Conference 2018. Uh, so uh, we'll get some more. If, if you can attend, you'll be rewarded with some, some great talks. But uh, after the conference is over in a couple of weeks, uh, make sure you go check those, uh, those uh, talks out. Um, <clears throat> OK, so the big news uh, in, in security. Usually, I don't have much to say about security. but. But this time around, I have a lot to say about security. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, these two really large, they're really kind of a large class of bugs. Um, but they also have one thing in common. And the, what they have in common is it's a way to break the security of the system uh, via side channel timing attacks using speculative execution. OK, so that's a. That's, uh, that's, there's a lot of detail to unpack in that sentence there. Uh, but let me, if you get into and start looking at some of the stuff about Spectre and Meltdown, uh, you'll see that there's often, people refer to three different variants. Uh, variant 1, Variant 2, uh, which are a form of Spectre, and Variant 3, which is a form of Meltdown. So there's, there's two main bugs, or class, classes of bugs, and then within those there's, there's these three different variants. Um, so the entire thing is a family of vulnerabilities related to speculative execution. And um, if you're not familiar, speculative execution is the, in modern processors, uh, instead of waiting for, uh, when, when the processor is going so fast that it's much faster than the processor can access memory. And so it can modify registers you know, maybe a hundred times faster than it can access memory. So in order to avoid slowing the processor down, it will actually start executing code before it's it's loaded the memory for what that code has to work on. And what it does is there's enough silicon, there's enough circuits to actually execute some things in parallel 
And then if it, if it finds out later that that's not the code path that the CPU was supposed to go down, it would then throw that, that result away. Uh, so it's executing, and it's speculative that it, it does it whether or not it knows it's going to use it. Uh, and the, the problem with these bugs is that people, researchers over just basically last summer, uh, figured out how to exploit this feature of modern processors. So a lot of processors have have the speculative execution. Almost all modern processors do. It's a very, very severe problem. Basically, it allows uh, a process to read data that it should not have access to. It is not supposed to have access. So a user space process is not supposed to have access to kernel data. Or uh, uh, one process should not have access to the data of another process, or should not have access to certain memory areas in, even within the same process. Interestingly, the, the vulnerability has existed for 20 years uh, before these exploits became available. So people have been doing speculative execution for 20 years in processors, and it just now um, has been, they figured out how to, how to do this exploit. Um, the big problem here is a lot of times when you get a security bug in a CPU, you can fix it. A lot of CPUs are ex essentially executing their own microcode internally. And so a lot of security bugs, almost all other security bugs, you can fix with a firmware update. Um, but this is not the case for this whole class of bugs, the speculative execution stuff. And the other thing that makes this really, really severe is that the mitigations, the way to solve the problem, are very expensive. And they, uh, with, and expensive in terms of uh, it slows your processor down uh, to, to do it. And a lot of, especially cloud providers, uh, they were very frightened that they were going to have uh, somewhere between 5 and 30% reduction in their performance, uh, which for a cloud provider is a huge, huge deal. So this is a very, very severe problem. And uh, I'm going to talk even a little bit more about it. So. Uh, just kind of help you understand how it works. The basic idea is in, in terms of how this works is you get the processor to execute something speculatively. So the processor is continually executing stuff speculatively, but what you want to do if you're going to exploit it is you, you make it execute something specific. You have some specific piece of code that you want it to execute uh, speculatively, even though you know you're not going to be able to see those results in the processor registers. Uh, what, what will happen is, as the processor does that speculative execution, uh, the data gets loaded into a uh, cache based on that. So uh, the whole purpose of speculative execution is to load data into cache ahead of time. And so that data gets into cache. And then the tricky part of this whole thing is, well, you can figure out what's in the cache by doing a, what's known as a timing attack. So if you time the access to get the data, uh, uh, you can see whether or not it's in the cache or not. So I have this analogy. I hope I hope it'll uh, help you understand, but we'll see. It's a cooking analogy. It's about mom making an apple, uh, a pie or a cake. Uh, so uh, just kind of bear with me, and I'll try to explain it. So uh, just think of your mom as is making uh, either a pie or a cake, and you're not allowed to know the ingredients for the pie. Uh, you aren't allowed to even eat the pie. Uh, but mom doesn't know who the dessert is for when she starts baking. She just knows she's going to have some people over. Uh, and she and so since she doesn't know ahead of time who the people are that she's going to feed, she, she makes both the pie and the cake. Uh, that's the speculative execution part. So to save time, she makes both of them. And then when you arrive at the door to, to, uh, to visit for a visit, uh, she just takes the pie and she throws it away, right? So that's the speculative execution part. And she gives you the cake, because that's what you like to eat. Um, so you never saw the pie, right? So that's how the, ex the execution is supposed to work. Since you were never allowed to eat the pie, you never saw the pie. Uh, but here's the tricky part. In order to bake, do that baking, she had to go to the store to get ingredients. And what happens is when she goes to the store to get ingredients, she saves them and, and leaves them in her pantry. Um, and so if you're very, very smart, very, very clever, you can ask her to make something for you 
afterwards. So you could say, hey, mom, could you make me some cookies? And uh, if, it, if it takes her a short time to make you the cookies uh, that you know the ingredients for, then you can figure out what ingredients are in her pantry. So basically you say, hey, mom, I want a cookie, you know, pumpkin cookies. And uh, if she says, oh, wait a minute, I, I have to go out to the store to, I'll, I'll make those for you, but I have to go to the store to, to get them. Uh, and then she shows up with cookies a half hour later. Then you know she didn't have pumpkin in her pantry. But if she says, oh, I'll whip those right up, and she bakes, up, bakes you up a batch of cookies in five minutes, you go, aha, she has pumpkin in her pantry, and now I know one of the ingredients in her pie. Um, and so basically, you get essentially each uh, exploit in Spectre Meltdown, you could get one bit of data from some other area of memory. And of course, you use the computer to do this a million times, do it over and over and over again. And pretty soon, you can read all of memory that way. Very, very tricky. Um, so hopefully that analogy is kind of helpful to understand what's going on there. Um, so I'm going to go through the variants. Uh, Spectre variant one is called bounds check bypass. Uh, this uses speculative execution to detect data outside the bounds of an array. So normally, in code, you check, the code in your system will check, and if, if you're trying to access data, it will not give you uh, data that's outside of the boundaries of an array. Uh, note that this does not cross security boundaries inside the processor, it's just crossing array boundaries within a single process. Um, so what processes are affected? Basically any with speculative execution. Every single processor with no speculative execution from ARM, Intel, or AMD, or others. Um, this is very difficult to fix. It's, um, and this is the one that was used in browser code. So inside browser code, people could uh, use this to have the code read data that was outside of uh, the arrays that were being read. So they could read passwords and other things that they weren't supposed to, that were protected by the code, but, but not effectively enough. So some of the mitigations that are around are there's a new fence operation that will actually prevent specu speculation. Uh, and there's a what's known as a bounds-friendly mask. Uh, so you can put a mask um, on uh, the code as it executes. And this prevents speculative code from accessing outside the array. Uh, there's, a, there's a new uh, function in the kernel called array index no spec which says, I'm going to look up something in this array, but I'm going to force the processor to not do it speculatively. But if, if the, basically it says if the stuff is not, um, well, it's hard to describe exactly what it does, but <laughs> it, it says if, if, uh, if the array uh, index is not within the boundary of the array, do not speculate and load the data. Uh, so it prevents that load. Um, so this, these mitigations are making their way into the Linux kernel. Not all of them have made it in. The next one, Spectre Variant 2, is called uh, Branch Target Injection. So one of the things the kernel does is there's a branch prediction buffer that kind of, uh, as, as the processor gets to a branch statement, an if statement, that tells it to go to one place or another place, it, there's a something called the branch prediction buffer, which will, which has built up um, a history over time, and it knows, like, it, you know, 95% of the time we're going to jump this way, it will actually speculate and make that jump for you. So this branch target injection, what that does is it poisons the branch prediction buffer. So if the code normally 95 jumps this way, what 95% of the time jumps this way, what the what this attack does is it trains that buffer in, internally to go the wrong way. Uh, so it'll go to the one that is only done 5% or 1% of the time, forcing the code speculatively down paths that uh, it didn't normally do. This is a very, very tricky one to, um, to perform, and it relies on a lot of the details of the internal architecture of the processor. Uh, many processors are affected. It's very difficult to, um, very difficult to exploit. Uh, but there are some things that can be done. There's a new RET, uh, RETPOLINE, which is a shortened form of return trampoline. 
Uh, this is basically the way to, it's a fancy return mechanism that avoids speculation, um, but you need compiler support for this. Um, so a lot of these specter mitigations require that the code be recompiled uh, and use these new features like ref gleams or the, the, uh, the other one I mentioned on variant one. There's also something called return stack buffer stuffing uh, and there's new processor flagged by Intel because some of these uh, impact performance, uh, Intel, Intel actually added some new flags to their processor to turn these mitigations, uh, the mitigations in hardware on or off um, so that you could still, if you knew a lot, a lot of these, um, a lot of these bugs uh, only apply if you're running a hostile code on your system. So at an embedded, uh, you're not running third-party code. You're running code that you compiled yourself. And so you might want to actually allow unsafe speculation on your system if you trust the code that you're running. So Intel has put these flags on the processor to allow people to do that. Uh, but there's a lot of controversy there. People are saying, well, why would you ever allow unsafe speculation? Well, in some circumstances, you it may be okay. Um, but there are flags that now you allow you to run unsafe speculation. Um, the final one of these, and this was the, the biggest one, uh, most serious, uh, and this was uh, variant three, referred to as meltdown, uh, also set called rogue data cache load. Uh, this one is really important because it crosses security boundaries. Um, and that means that a user space process can read kernel memory. Uh, that was very, very serious. So basically, if you could read kernel memory, you, there's no security boundaries at all left on, this, on the system. So this is very, very serious. That means that, especially for cloud providers, that one process on a, on a cloud server could read the data of the kernel and the other processes on the server. So you know, if, if I happen to be, if my program ended up getting loaded on the same uh, cloud provider as like a bank, I could go into the bank's processes memories, read all of the passwords and the accounts and everything. So it was very, very serious. Um, so basically it's determining data in the kernel address space through speculative execution. Uh, and the problem, the bug in the processor was that the data is read prior to the check of the security privilege when uh, the processor is speculating. Uh, so the results are retired uh, when the security privilege is processed, and that's that's the part where the stuff is thrown away. The results are thrown away, uh, but it's too late. At that point, the data is already in the cache, and using that cache timing uh, thing, you can determine the value. So the processors that are affected were not AMD. AMD made a big deal about this, uh, but. A lot of Intel processors and essentially one of the ARM processors, are only the ARM Cortex-A75. Uh, the mitigation for this also was very expensive. It's called KPTI or Kernel Page Table Isolation. And uh, what this does is it actually changes fundamentally how the Linux kernel memory is mapped. It removes, normally the kernel address space is actually mapped uh, to and, and in the same uh, memory regions as users, the user process, but they're just not available because you get a security fault uh, if you try to access them. Uh, but uh, now they've actually been completely moved out, so they're no longer in the same address space. Uh, but this is very expensive because now on every system call, you have to do a big remapping of the memory space address spaces. Um, so this is a very, very severe bug. And had a very expensive mitigation. Um, so uh, this whole thing happened. Um, it basically, uh, this stuff was discovered last summer, uh, almost six months ago. Uh, there are lots of questions and a lot of complaints about how these security bugs were handled. Uh, the flaws were detected by multiple security researchers. This is actually kind of amazing. There were three different security researchers so these bugs have been sitting in our processors for 20 years, and over a period of like four months, three different groups found them and figured out how to exploit them. Uh, everyone in the industry that knew about this 
uh, agreed to an information embargo until January. And the embargo mostly held. So that they, they didn't want to disclose this and let, uh, let bad guys figure out how to exploit these. But the news did break about one week early on January 2nd. Uh, one of the big complaints uh, is that the normal Linux security channels were not used. So there's, there's specifically, there is a security email list for the kernel, uh, security at kernel.org. And uh, that was not used because they wanted to keep it quiet and they, did, they didn't follow normal security procedures. Um, and so there were a lot of complaints about kernel developers who could have helped out uh, but did not get the information soon enough. There's a lot of distros who found out very late during this embargo period. A lot of tier two operating systems like BSD didn't find out about it until the news broke. Uh, a lot of uh, cloud customers, the tier two cloud customers did not get enough notice. So there's a lot of complaints about the, the handling of this. But it was a very, very big deal. So it's, you know, it's, uh, I was on a call this morning uh, with the technical advisory board, and it's, it's the type of thing that just doesn't come along, and it's really a rare thing to have something this severe. Uh, so people did as, as good as they could. Um, the status of the mitigations for all this, uh, and this is very important. If you have code out in products, it's very important to get that code patched, especially uh, if you run untrusted code. So a lot of embedded devices, we don't. We're, we're running code that's trusted. But if you're talking about Android, where third-party code is running, or some other platform where you're loading code from a third party and running it, uh, very important to get all of the, the mitigation patches. Uh, so a lot of the patches have been backported to previous uh, long-term stable releases. Uh, but the status of the mitigations, variant one, Spectre, uh, there's this bounds masking that's still being worked on. Some of this is in 4.15 to 4.16, but much more work is expected. Uh, in var for variant 2, some of the red is in 4.15. Uh, there's these new flags from Intel on their processors. And then the variant 3 code, the KPPI, is actually available now in 4.15 for Intel and 4.16 for ARM64. Um, so a lot of this stuff there are mitigations for, including back for some of the long-term stable releases of the kernel. Uh, but anyway, so that's, uh, sorry, that was a very long sidetrack, but I thought this was one of the most important issues that uh, has occurred in the last uh, last year. And in fact, probably the last, uh, in terms of security, one of the biggest stories in the last maybe 10 years. Um, other things, uh, not, <laughs> Other things are actually going on with kernel security. There's a whole kernel hardening project. Uh, just because we fixed Spectre and Meltdown, there's lots of other stuff uh, going on, people trying to uh, attack the kernel. So you see uh, these are some of the projects that are gone. There's some GCC plugins for kernel security having to do with uh, kern exec, which is preventing the kernel from executing user space code, leaking structure data, uh, randomizing C structure layouts, uh, so there's uh, there continue to be uh, a whole lot of work done uh, trying to get uh, the kernel more secure. Uh, and there's some presentations if you want to see on specific things uh, using uh, Linux with TPMs, trust uh, protected modules, and uh, security features and file systems, UBIFS. Okay, so that was a long, sorry, that was a long time on, on uh, Linux security. Uh, I'll go kind of quickly through the rest of this. So system size, um, the init RAMFS compression method is selectable. Nicholas Petrie has been doing a ton of work. I talked about the mini TTY. He added configurable POSIX timers in 4.10. Um, he's been doing uh, a lot of work. He uh, did some work on shrinking the scheduler, Linux scheduler. Uh, saved about 20K. It doesn't sound like a lot, but, uh, but when you get down to really small sizes, that ends up being a big chunk of the kernel. Uh, there's a disagreement on list about how small people should be trying to make the Linux kernel, but a lot of people would like to get the Linux kernel in under one meg. Um, so there's been some presentations and some boffs uh, at Embedded Linux Conference. There's a, there's a good overview of lots of different uh, things having to do with size reduction by Michael Optenacker. Um And then Nicholas Petrie has been doing a lot of the technical work on this. Um, and there's a really excellent presentation at Lenaro Connect that he gave. You can see the video for that. And Marcel Holtman from Intel uh, was able to demonstrate Linux uh, running around uh, about one megabyte uh, for an IoT sensor project that he did. So you can actually get 
uh, Linux is very, very tiny. So, well, one megabyte is not super, super tiny, but it's uh, much smaller than a normal Linux system. Uh, Nicholas Petrie, in particular, has done a lot of the work here, and he has a series of articles on LWM.net covering lots of issues, how to do this, link time optimization, how to remove SUS systems, trimming unused kernel symbols. He's got a four, it's, he's done, released three parts of a four-part series. There's one more part coming. Uh, this is stuff that uh, usually requires a subscription, but only for the first two weeks, so if you wait long enough, uh, you'll be able to read all of them. But three of the articles are already up. Uh, this one up here is the third article of the four-part series. Uh, so if you're interested in size, definitely go check that out. Uh, okay, so now moving on to testing. Uh, the K-Self test project uh, is going strong. Fuego, Kernel CI, Lava, uh, and then uh, these, some of these other topics. So K-Self test is a unit test framework inside the Linux source tree. Uh, the biggest news here really recently is converting to the CAP 13 protocol, test anything protocol for the test output. That started in 4.13 and they're in the process of migrating. So what they're trying to do is get all of the tests to produce the same, to consistent, uh, consistent format so it can be used with a test framework. Uh, that's actually uh, very useful. Uh, if you're doing unit testing, I in the kernel, I recommend adding stuff to KSELF test. Uh, Fuego is a test framework for collaborating on tests and test infrastructure. It's the one I work on. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it. I gave a whole big talk last last time. You can read about that. Um, kernelci.org uh, is still going strong. Uh, it's a it's a test it's a uh, test system that consists of about ten different labs, and uh, really uh, I think it's uh, over a hundred boards, uh, building and booting like 126 different kernel trees uh, on a daily basis. They have literally hundreds of thousands of boot cycles, uh, and they found lots of bugs. Uh, so it's, uh, I call it the most successful public distributed build and test system for Linux. Uh, so that's something to check out if you want uh, to do your system now. Uh, Kernel CI is built on top of Lava, which is Lenaro's uh, test system. Uh, and here's some of the features in the V2 that actually came out um, quite a while ago now. This slide is a little bit old. Uh, uh, but there's some other efforts going on. Uh, there was a lot of talk over the summer about adding some stuff to do kernel regression tracking. Uh, and then there was, uh, in the fall, there was a session on plumbers uh, dedicated to testing. So if you go to these LWM.net articles, uh, you can find a lot of the links to the presentations and an overview of the, uh, of the stuff that happened at, at these events. In terms of tool chains, um, not a whole lot going on. Uh, there's uh, people are trying to build a kernel with uh, LLVM and uh, Clang, uh, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, tracing, the big news here is uh, something called dy dynamic function tracing events. Uh, this is the ability to create a trace point for a function at runtime. So you actually compile the kernel without tracing, and uh, you can actually create a new trace point that includes the parameters for the, for the, that the trace point's going to grab. At runtime, so this is a little bit beyond just doing K probes or some of the other dynamic things where you can you can stick a probe point in, but this actually does a full trace point. Uh, one of the reasons they want to do this is a lot of subsystems in the kernel are very hesitant to add trace points. They don't want uh, they don't want the trace point to become something that developers rely on, become part of the kernel uh, ABI, and so they think by doing it dynamically. It'll send a clear message that this is not something you can rely on from release to release. This is actually a work in progress. These are not. This feature is not upstream yet. If you're interested in tracing, I highly recommend uh, looking at this presentation from ELC 27 by uh, Hiroyuki Ishii um, on dynamic tracing tools. It says for ARM and ARC64, but it is probably the best overview of tracing uh, on the Linux kernel that I've ever seen. It's got some great uh, diagrams that show you the different parts of the system and how they work and kind of the current status of everything. So really, really great talk there. Um, so just a couple of miscellaneous issues before we wrap it up here. Um, we we'll talk about printk, year 2038, some of these other things. Uh, so the printk issues, I've talked about this before. 
a lot of people are not that happy with Print K. There has been some work uh, to change Print K, uh, having to do with the uh, it's well some of the issues with it. It's not per CPU. The console lock is held too long. It has too complicated code paths. So, so a lot of people have been discussing how to fix it. There, there's actually some issues with something called Kern Continue. Uh, it's a that's the way that you uh, that the print case system in the kernel does messages that are split between in, in different parts of your code, but you ought to occur all on the same line. You use a kern count uh, uh, specifier as part of your string. But in any event, a lot of people would like to get rid of that and use something else to, to try to combine lines in the kernel. Um, so there's work going on in, in print K. In terms of year 2038, actually there's a there's a lot of good work going on. It has been going on for a while. I talked about the new static system call. So a lot of the timestamps in the kernel. Uh, so the year 2038, that's that's the year when our 32-bit timestamps will start to roll over and mess everything up. So we're keeping the number of seconds since 1970 uh, in a 32-bit value. And in January, uh, somewhere, sometime in 2038, that's going to roll over and cause all kinds of problems. So we're trying to convert everything over to 64 bit. But you have to do some work in the kernel. You have to do it in the C libraries, and you have to do it actually in the individual programs. So you have to go to the distributions and, and make sure the the actual programs in the system are are using timers correctly. So there's a lot of work, but it's uh, we're we are 20 years away. It seems like a long time away for us to be worried about this issue. But there are systems now that will probably get in place. There will be something built into some bridge or train or power plant or something that we want to still run in 20 years from now. So um, uh, Linus had some issues with kconfig. He wanted to uh, improve uh, some of the way that kconfig was done. Uh, you can read about that. Uh, I'm not, I think I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'm going to skip over some of these issues. Uh, AGL is doing really well. Uh, this is automotive grade Linux by the Linux Foundation. The first car in the US was already shipped, Toyota Camry that has AGL code. And Mazda and Toyota are, are some of the companies that are collaborating on, on some of these, uh, the stack. Android, a uh, lot of progress has been made um, getting Android. This used to be a huge, huge issue. And there's still a lot of code that's out of tree which is why you can't just take uh, a mainline kernel and, and put it on your Android phone or tablet. Uh, but the reality is there's still so much out of tree that it's likely that, that uh, Android will be two years behind mainline. So this is really, this is really critical because LTS long-term stable support expires in two years. And uh, Greg just announced this year that he is going to maintain some LTS kernels for six years. Uh, but in, just to help with this particular problem, uh, because a lot of devices were, uh, the LTS support was expiring just as devices were getting on the market with, with the kernel. Um, so there is interest uh, by Android in improving support for uh, Linux test project, which is really good. Uh, that will help the entire industry. Okay. Linux and supercomputers, already, I already did this stat. Linux is now running at 100% of the top 500 supercomputers. That's pretty amazing. There's not a single one that's not running Linux. Um, that was as of November. Um, and then free RTOS, uh, which is not a Linux uh, thing, but uh, if you're in the R we also kind of pay attention to what's going on in the RTOS world, uh, the sub Linux thing. Free RTOS was switched to the MIT license, uh, which is pretty interesting. It used to be a GPL v2 with some extra clauses that were kind of annoying. Um, and uh, now it's now it's got a um, a nicer license. Um, so CE workgroup projects. Um, I've done these before. There's not a new a lot of new stuff here. So the shared embedded distribution. Um, talk to Kobayashi-san if you want to find out about that. LTSI. Uh, same thing. No no new news here from when I talked about it in December. Uh, Linux taste framework. The only couple of new things, but the um, biggest thing here is we want to interop interoperate with board farm standards, uh, but there aren't any. <laughs> so first we have to create some board farm standards. Uh, and uh, so we're probably going to plan some kind of test automation track at Plumbers. 
um, in the fall to, to come up with some board farm standards. So we're working on a lot of uh, improvements to Fuego, including I just got a set of patches from Toshiba today for some LTP improvements, uh, improved visualization, and stuff like that. Um, the eLinux Wiki is a great resource for seeing all things about embedded Linux. And in particular, we've got the slides and videos for 12 years of ELC. So if there are hundreds of hundreds of pages covering numerous topic areas, but really the stuff that's most up to date are the presentations. And you can find uh, just presentations on just about any embedded Linux topic um, from our conferences. Um, uh, let's see, trade associations, I'm gonna pass this one. Conferences, okay, so conferences coming up. Uh, embedded Linux Conference Europe had a lot of great sessions. That was the most recent major uh, embedded Linux conference, but next uh, two weeks from now is uh, embedded Linux conference in Portland, uh, which is kind of scaring me because I got to I got to still finish my slides. Uh, I've got to talk there, um, so hopefully if you're going to that, we'll see you there. But if not, then uh, it'd be a lot of great content available in about. Uh, uh, it probably takes about a week or two to get the the videos up, but the presentations go along pretty go online pretty quickly. Japan Jamborees, we have the Open Source Summit in Japan. It's a little bit later this year. Usually the, like the first week of June. This is like the third week of June this year. Um, but that's something coming up. Uh, and then uh, ELC Europe is coming up in uh, October in Scotland. So a lot of great stuff coming up for conferences. Uh, one other random issue, kind of miscellaneous thing, is we're seeing uh, this is a legal issue. We're seeing SPDX adopted by the Linux kernel. So there was a uh, in 4.14, actually 4.14 RC7, uh, which is really late in the development cycle. Usually you do not see a, a big patch applied late in the development cycle. This one was done for a particular reason. A lot of files, I think it was like 14,000 files, were tagged with SPDX license IDs. Um, so. Uh, that's very, very interesting. So the, the kernel, in order to kind of get some better uh, quality in terms of the interpretation of the license and the uh, declaring uh, files, what, what their actual license is, has adopted SPDX. So if you are a kernel developer, you'll probably have to start, you know, I probably have to learn how to put an SPDX identifier on your, on your file going forward so that we can... Uh, uh, That'll probably be a new rule in the, in the future. The other thing that has come up recently uh, is that Linux Comp Australia uh, developer by the name of Daniel Vetter uh, gave a talk uh, about the issue of community conduct. And he complained about that some maintainers are kind of abusive, but he thought they were abusive. Um, uh, there were other talks at the same event that described how to get involved. Uh, Daniel Vetter had kind of a low opinion of the status of uh, community conduct. So the Linux Foundation uh, Technical Advisory Board has actually been looking at this issue. In 2015, two years ago, they issued a, a statement called the Code of Conflict, uh, saying that if you have any issues with how people are being treated out in the community, you can bring them to us and we'll investigate them and try to resolve them. Uh, but because of this renewed, but nothing is, not very many issues have been reported. and. And uh, so, because there still seem to be these complaints lingering about how, how people are treating each other on the mailing lists and, and stuff, uh, the tab is currently still discussing possible actions to try to improve community discourse. It'll never be perfect. Uh, people, are, people are human and they have social issues, getting along with other people, but, uh, but anything we can do to improve, we, we try to help out. So we may actually see some, uh, some things in the next year uh, coming out could be some documentation or some some specific actions to try and try and improve things. So that's it for the talk. These are where I get my information. If you want to learn about Linux kernel, uh, you should subscribe to lwn.net. Uh, that is the primary site uh, for keeping track of kind of the major developments going on in the kernel. Uh, I use kernel newbies actually a lot to go read about what's in each release. Um, and then you can uh, use the eLinux wiki uh, to track stuff. When we, when we decided to start uh, organizing some ideas around the automated testing software, 
Uh, we put some pages on the eLinux wiki, and that's actually where we keep a lot of the information on how to run a board farm, uh, and with, you know, different hardware that's good, different software that's good. And then you can always email the C Linux dev mailing list. So with that, I will thank you for your time, and uh, uh, I guess uh, open, open up for any questions you have on the material that I presented. Okay, thanks, Tim. I have a, one question, small question about uh, uh, pie and cake. That analogy is really <laughs> interesting. Is it original of Tim Bird or somebody else? Uh, I wish it was. I, and so the pie and cake is, it's, a lot of it is stuff I added to, but I actually saw this, it was by uh, Geert Uterhoven, oh, really? who came up with the idea of having a recipe uh -huh. and being able to see what's in the recipe from, from uh, someone else. So I simplified it and changed it a little bit, but I cannot take credit for it. I see. But that's that's how open source works. Okay. <laughs> so it means that uh, I can we can make it uh, in a Japanese translation to circulate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks. えっと、あの、実はちょっとこれマイクここからあの音声拾ってますんで、質問がある方はちょっとマイク回しますんで、ちょっとお願いします。Any uh, question ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、